Our scene opens on the Wan Cao residence. Gifts distributed and goodbyes finalized. The match three stand in a circle. If they were touchy-feely people, they may have joined hands, but those feelings had been separated and contributed to why Rachel was so personable. The mats are fine without touching. They don't need contact to be in sync. Matt, would you do the honors? Of course. The dungeon matster took control of the scene, arms stretched wide, cape flapping as a wind arose from nowhere. A mist began to swirl around the three as he began to narrate. As the mats three stood encircled, a mist arose, obscuring them from the view of Rachel and Query. With a loud crack, the mist parted and they were gone. Reality complied with his narrated story. A crack of thunder caused Rachel to wince, and when the mist cleared, the mats were indeed gone. The narration continued beyond what Ray could hear, but as she could not hear it, she had no idea where they had gone. We, however, can listen into the narration continuing, and with some magical camera focus, unfettered by mass or form, we follow as the view falls far beneath the island, and we hear the voice of a mat continuing. Beneath the island, far from the surface, the match three reappeared, as the place that Max had once taken them to, in preparation for a day of terrible conflict. With the defenses down, the path is easy, and in seconds, the mats gazed upon their goal, a prize to be obtained, a power to be defended. And as the voice rang out in the cavern where they now stood, it was indeed so and the cold blue glow of a pun that held the island against the worlds outside was all that illuminated them, reflecting against glasses half-moon, round, and square. Max headquarters, back in August. Max waited, expectantly. Say should have reached Matt's home by now, and her abduction ray had been carefully calibrated before she left. For the eighth time that morning, he adjusted his tie and straightened the cuffs of his suit. Under normal conditions, with an audience, Max was the picture of a cool cucumber, each word, gesture, and expression calculated for manipulation and profit. But even a cool cat can be rattled when revealing a powerful secret to someone who had yet to pledge himself as an ally. There were countermeasures prepared, of course. Most assumed that opening gates to the dark timeline versions across the island was uncontrolled, a desperate act of finality, a final measure. But not so. Sure, to open portals for each star of the island, it was best to make it seem uncontrolled, but as a premeditated weapon against a single target, precision and subtlety were possible, and a version of Matt had been selected, held against the moment she would be needed. Picking a duplicate for a specific purpose was tricky, and Max and his team had labored over the process. Many of the dark timeline variations were just a copy with the evil turned up to eleven. The power a person could wield seemed to be related to what they thought of others. The less you considered things like civilians and casualties or even causality, the more power you could wield. The universe found ways to balance such things eventually, of course. In most universes, the side of right would prevail. Eventually. In this particular instance, however, Max needed a way to stop Matt that did not involve summoning a crazier, more magical version. Such a foe would increase his problems, not decrease them. They had combed the multiverse and found a version of Matt who had physical prowess instead of mental, and could shrug off powerful magical effects like a duck sheds water. She did seem crazier, but in that familiar, down-to-earth, murderous rage that could certainly be directed against a specific foe. A fitting failsafe when showing Matt what was potentially the most powerful magical artifact in existence. A circle of light appeared on the floor, and the air in the room went crazy. Papers from Max's desk flew into the air and circled around the portal that Matt was emerging from. It was not a dignified entrance, but that was hardly Matt's fault. The abduction ray has many benefits, like the lack of required consent. It did not do much for the victim's dignity, however. Matt stood in the circle as he tried to get his bearings. He sighed as he saw Max behind his desk, grinning. I take it I'm expected? You're a bit behind schedule, which is a shame as we have many things to talk about. Max's grin took on a bit of a wry twist. But as the schedule was left in the hands of me and mine, and you weren't exactly consulted, I'm willing to be lenient. Donut? Matt approached the desk, his glare at the Lord of Cannon Island, mostly concealed by his opaque glasses. I suppose this is where you'll offer me some sort of deal I can't refuse, or make a point later that accepting the donut meant I accepted the whole deal. Max steepled his hands. 
While it is admittedly refreshing to discuss contracts with someone actually prepared to match me blow for blow with sheer nastiness, I'm afraid my need for you to be a willing participant outweighs the pleasure such entrapment would bring me. Our contracts will be signed in ink with no small print or other trickery, and while you may refuse this position, your window for doing so without consequence will certainly close at some point in the proceeding. Matt sat in the chair across from Max and selected a donut. Whether that chair was there a moment ago or not is up to the reader or perhaps the artist to determine. When my subordinates floated the idea of a magical school event, your name came up as a way to add authenticity to the event. As I looked into your file, your interactions with the island impressed me. Sources describe you as intelligent, sane, and logical, yet willing to conform to all sorts of silly restrictions of the world at hand. The RPG took me by surprise. As other members crossed over, they assumed forms of fighters and mages, even a dragon. But you? You took on the form of the Dungeon Master, a role I had already taken. Bold of you, but it seemed to fit, and that made me wonder. My crew has parts of what we're calling the school event beginning to form. We were going to invite you to run that, but as I considered your file, I wonder if I can't entrust you with a deeper secret and a stronger responsibility. Matt took a bite of the donut and contemplated Max's monologue as he chewed. He swallowed and set the remnant on the little plate. There would, of course, have to be a fair trade. If I'm doing a service for you, one big enough that you're asking me, it's not going to be free, and it is unlikely to be cheap. A demon after my own heart? Nonsense, I had the demon cut out of me. Of course you did. Remuneration will certainly be fair. Then I'm willing to hear the job. It'll start with an explanation from you. Why do you think the island exists? And what do you know about the TG Wars? Matt frowned as he considered. He hadn't dealt with the island much. He had read a bit and seen an episode or two of the show, as everyone had. But even with the small escapades around the island, he didn't feel like he knew it all that well. He was more one to stay in his lab and tinker and let Rachel do the dealings with the outside. The second question, however, seemed to paint the first in a new light. The wars never reached our universe, he began. We heard of them, of course, and there were all sorts of things like making up care packages for the transformed, and I think we took in some refugees? I know it was bad for those caught in the crossfire. It's a common enough story, said Max. A lot of the records are lost, but there were certainly thousands, if not millions, of victims whose only crime was being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So, what does that have to do with us? I heard something about a prison, Matt said slowly. A way to lock the powerful combatants away where they can't cause damage. And this conversation seems to imply the prison may be connected to your first question, which would make sense. Powerful characters are trapped with a convenient plot wall to keep them from escaping. Bingo, said Max, making finger guns. Got it in one. Most of it. The plot wall can't keep characters from breaking out of the island. Any individual story can get past a simple plot wall. Max leaned forward and braced his chin on his hands. I can show you how we keep people in, but it marks the line of your window closing. After this, I need your agreement, or consequences must become dire. Matt needed no time for consideration. Show me. Beneath the Island, Present Day like a trio of Macbethian witches, three mats stand in a circle around a glowing, smoking object. While not a cauldron with eye of newt or hair of frog, it did not lack in power. Here, Dumblemat, or the headmatster, took over. Each of the mats had a specialty of their own. One was science, one was story, and for Dumblemat, his was sorcery. More precisely, his was wizardry, but for purposes of alliteration, sorcery is close enough. As he carefully caresses the object of their attention with magic, it twists and writhes and changes in response. It seems, gentlemen, we got here in time. While the island has certainly faced hardships, it has not been destroyed. Shall we proceed? The others nod their assent, and Doublemat begins a carefully crafted spell, words and gestures and applications of power carefully enticing a plot device, still carefully obscured from the audience to respond to his incantations. This will take a while, so let's jump back into a flashback, shall we? Beneath the Island, last August. And that's the idea for the school. Sound good? 
It'll work. But I'm going to leave you in charge, by name at least. That way I can feign a higher power that must be appeased. I can live with being a figurehead. Headmaster Max certainly has a ring to it. Here we are. They emerged from a twisting cave into a cavern that would look quite similar to an astute reader who's been paying attention, except that this is in the past, and instead of the plot device writhing in response to magic, it lay dormant in a familiar shape. Is that the island? It looks like that when it's still. Max set down his lantern and fiddled with it so its light was more diffuse. When this thing's happening, it changes. They stared at it for a second. Then Max turned to Matt, removing his dark glasses. Matt took a half step back, seeing Max's eyes for the first time. But as scary as they were, he could see the seriousness in them. This room must be kept absolutely a secret. With people like Sagrin on the island, anything that's revealed, even if marked private, will be available for all to hear. This room is too important to let someone find, by any means. This is the premise, the core of the island, beyond the plot wall. The plot wall lets me reset things at will, so slow changes can be undone and damage can be removed. But as I said, any story can break past the plot wall if there's enough oomph behind it. What a story can't write around is the premise. The premise is constructed from the willpower of multiple worlds, hoping that the TG Wars will never come to their shores. And while it's left alone, they never will. All the multiverse conflicts get filtered here, onto this island. And then you film it for TV. I film them to provide evidence to a multi-universal tribunal that the plan is working, and they don't have to annihilate the island and all the characters reside in here. Editing it into a hit TV show that has had consistent ratings for six seasons, that's just a byproduct. And it's more fun than anything else. All of the toys and action figures and the like, well, the audience demanded it. I'm sure. What does this have to do with me? There's, um, a storm brewing. I can't be sure when. I can't say exactly how. But one day, the plot barrier will be brought down, and the island will be turned against me. Everything and everyone will be focused on keeping me busy. I'm sure I'll be beaten in many, many fights, and a lot of my empire will be brought down. You'll be my ace up the sleeve. While I'm out there drawing the eye, I need you to come down here and secure the island's premise so no one can get to it. If it falls into unsavory hands, the TG Wars will return in full force, and this time they will spread into every world that knows about them. Why me? You have a level head with a good knowledge of magic, science, and story. You're a moral individual likely to do the right thing, yet uh, willing to accept bribes to ensure your loyalty. Once bought, you'll stay bought. And you know enough of the big picture to not get distracted by inconsequential details. Matt looked at the premise. The glow reflected in his glasses. I can't do it alone. Max smiled. That I can certainly help you with. Deep below ground, present day. Matt watches as the spell completes and the premise considers the request. The plan wasn't complicated, but it had been entirely theoretical. There had been no time nor opportunity to test this procedure, and while it worked fine on paper, that meant little in the real world. Or as real as this world got. They needed to act quickly before anyone noticed the various energies they were working with. Story allowed the group to travel quickly to an impossible location. Sorcery allowed the mats to access the interplay of the island. And with any luck, science would allow them to complete their objective. Working with Max behind the scenes had been tricky, but with Dumble Matt to coordinate efforts, they had pulled off some interesting things. Max's bribes were substantial. They weren't things like money, although it was certainly offered, but the Matts preferred access to his technology. As part of the allocations that a hundred worlds provided to keep the island running, Max had some really neat toys. The multidimensional connection commutator, for example, allowed one to play roulette with the universe and find people and things in worlds only tangentially related to our own. It was fruitful and addicting. Gentlemen, phase two seems to have been a success. Matt brought his focus to the here and now at Dumble Matt's words. The premise was beginning to fold and stretch as the island reconfigured around their desires. This meant the island was permuting through realities, which goes unnoticed to most. Perhaps a tree shifts location and maybe a character trips on a rock that had not been there, but the real change is in the cavern of the premise. Or rather, the lair of the premise. 
As the powerful artifact writhes, the stone walls give way to metal, the darkness gives way to cold artificial light, and the hum of electronics begins to fill the stillness. A lair fit for a supervillain, or even a trio of supervillains, each with their own specialties and agenda. The mats had little illusion about what they were preparing to do. The biggest change to the cave was of the premise itself. It was now wrapped in glass and chrome, with wires and lasers and all sorts of connections, leading to a bank of computers, undoubtedly super if not better. This had been the tricky step. The before and after could be planned and prepared, but the three had been unsure that the premise would be able to reconfigure itself for convenient computer access. They had more primitive methods of defense on standby, but automating their control and their gathering of information was certainly a time saver. And simplified the heck out of phase three, which began now as the mats moved to their stations. In his green lab coat, Matt Wandkow stands in front of a bank of computers and begins to flip switches and input commands. His first collection of movements end with a firm slam on a bright red button, and a toroid of static expands out from the premise in response, encompassing the mats and moving beyond the metal walls of the lair. Not too far behind. If you listen, you can still hear the buzz of the static. Localized plot while activated, we're secure from the outside, he announces, his hands already working on the programming, the next task. Dumblemat Station, for this phase at least, seems to be the most comfortable, as he sits in an overstuffed chair and reclines, letting out a large sigh. Phase 2 had taken a lot out of him, trying to coerce a powerful artifact into willingly following through with their plans. He didn't do much with computers, anyway, and the other mats could handle it. The Dungeon Master's station would be incomprehensible to most else, a screen showing lines branching off, reconverging, and splintering. He shakes his head as he studies it. The stories are going everywhere. We have timelines and contradictory events arising all over the place. Look, Repitamonte just whooped the snot out of us over here. And this one? Are they leaving the island in droves? asked Dumble Matt from his chair. Actually, they aren't. A few characters have left, but most are staying on the island. A lot more than we had estimated. From his station, Matt furrows his brow. His part of Phase 3 was simple enough, although he had to be careful not to miss any element of the island. Shinto Shrine, Victorian London District, Molly's Magic School, the Amusement Park, the Chain of Max Burgers, the Shattered Remains of Dark Timeline Joe, locations flicker in the reflection of his glasses as he adds each to the growing registry. The fact that people hadn't left the island could make Phase 4... tricky. Witnesses made quantum problems problematic. If we took that aforementioned magic camera and turned its view to see exactly what Matt was doing in relation to the island, it would look like locations all across the island, even points beyond, were being momentarily converted to a wireframe as the system scanned all locations currently existing, and a few that had been put aside. All of these were catalogued and registered in Matt's databanks. I think I sussed it. Dungeon Matt was tracing lines on the computer that were somehow leaving the surface of the screen as they spread into the air. It looks like when the plot wall was taken down, it left residue. Not enough to keep corralling the stories together, but at its foundation level, Max was using it to keep people from making long-term plans. Some of that is still around. More mind control? Not precisely. More like a magic trick. In the remaining plot field, it's easier to get distracted by short-range stuff than with long-range stuff. So things like beating Max and dealing with their dark selves, that took priority to the GTFOing. A moment of silence stretched its way across the lair. After a moment, it's broken by the mat in the armchair. Can we still enact Phase 4? The other mats in their consoles had been considering the same question, but now that it was spoken aloud, it moved from a question of doubt to one of operational success. The dungeon master shakes his head. The timelines are too splintered. Trying to organize everything so we can make a clean break is going to be a nightmare. Matt Wandkow chimes in from his station. At the same time, the locations are mixed together much more than we thought. It's also going to take ages, this time to separate. Then we must adapt our plans, said Dumble Matt, rising from his chair and summoning his cane to him. If we cannot cleanly destroy the island and seal the worlds from each other, what can we do to keep the warring fires of transformation away from civilian shores? 
There's that old adage, said the dungeon master. If you can't beat them, join them. Some stories end with soldiers settling down instead of being conquerors of worlds. If we monitor the storylines, we can keep them here, at least. Maybe they can find peace on their own. And what's more, we can filter all multidimensional traffic through the island, said the Matt of Science, beginning to input commands. So while the fighting here may not be under control, war should never be able to bypass our shores. Then we are agreed the island must remain? The chorus of ascents rang out through the lair. Very well. Our phase four has been inverted. Instead of destroying the island, we have become its caretakers. A curious twist of the story. It will be interesting to watch where it goes. And with that, our mystical camera backs away from the lair of the mats three, back through the stone and dirt of the island, and zooms out to an aerial view that shows the island's breadth and scope, and the slowly morphing terrain that makes up its features. With a buzz, the outline of the island buzzes with the same static of the localized plot wall as the Mats 3 begin their vigil. To creators and even characters who listen to this, fret not. The Mats 3 will not interfere in regular attacks and alliances, but they will if war threatens the shores of the reality you call home. Be grateful, for this is a service Max never provided, not even for a fee. And if you need them, or need some structure to exist on the island, shoot them an email. They have surprisingly good internet down there. This is Matt IV, author and creator, signing off.